Well, how do you follow Martha Lane Fox? It's a bit unfair going second, but um, it was great talk as always, Martha, but I was really interested in some of what you said. And as you were talking, I was thinking, what are the, what are the more kind of cynical, the more anxious people going to be saying to, to some of these things? We both know what it is to work with cynical, anxious people in this particular um, arena. And I was thinking about the kind of, you know, the, the switching off services and the kind of closing down of post offices and the changing landscape of communities in Britain. And the internet is now kind of marching into our, into our community fabric. And what is it doing? And how is it going to change the way we communicate and the way we live? And are we all just going to like grow really big thumbs? Is this the next stage of evolution as we just spend our whole time kind of pressing buttons? Are we ever going to, are we going to be able to talk to each other? And so on and so on and so on. And, and this kind of stuff, I think, is, is, is what I would call the moral panic that surrounds the whole conversation about digital divides. And my digital divide that I'm particularly interested in and I've been working with in terms of government and, and, and my review last year is looking at the issues around children, young people, and uh, the digital um, lives that they have. And for those of you that aren't aware, just to kind of give you a very quick kind of run through, I was asked by Gordon Brown, our Prime Minister, just, um, if he, it, sorry, um, and I was, I was actually asked, I'd just been to my, um, I'd just been to a publishing lunch, I'd just published a book and I'd had about three glasses of wine, so I was in that kind of, well, hey, going to number 10, what's the Prime Minister going to ask me to do? And he said, oh, you know what, um, something about kids and technology and we're all a bit scared and, you know, predators and grooming and cyber stuff and what do you reckon? And I said, okay, well, you know, why not? And, um, and then thought, what have I let myself in for? And interestingly, didn't realize how little I knew about all this until I started. And then realized that there was a, actually a massive digital divide in my own home when I realized how kind of suspicious I was about my own children's use of technology. My son, Jack, is 11. My daughter, Lily, is 14. And both of them are multi-platform, multimedia uh, content consumers and creators. And um, for a long time, I, like many parents and adults, sort of had more concern than understanding of what they were doing. Anyway, so I was asked to look at harmful and inappropriate um, content when it comes to children and young people. And I just want to be really clear here, that's not illegal. So I wasn't asked to look at the illegal stuff, the illegal stuff like child abuse images, uh, child pornography. We have a mechanism in the UK called the Internet Watch Foundation. Some of you might be aware of it. It's an independent organisation that will let ISPs know where these images are and they then can block them. And currently about 89% of ISPs in the UK have signed up to this so we've still got a bit of a way to go but that is uh, one way of understanding how we manage illegal content online in the UK but I wasn't asked to look at that I was asked to look at harmful and inappropriate and actually to begin with when I was putting out my terms of reference I realized very quickly that content in and of itself is a very narrow thing to think about when you're looking at the digital divide you have to not just think about content but you have to think about contact and you have to think about conduct and really the whole piece for me is about digital citizenship and I was in the States a couple of weeks ago at a, at a conference about digital ci citizenship and just before I went I I kind of got my research team together, which is basically Lily and Jack and their mates who'd come round for tea, and said, now listen, what do you think about this digital citizenship thing? And they looked at me as if I was an absolute idiot. And they said, mum, it's not digital citizenship, it's citizenship, it's what we do. And I realized how clunky we are. As adults, we still see the digital, we see the online and the offline, and kids generally tend to see the whole thing as one piece. It's who they are and how they live their lives. Now, when you start to do any work around issues which have such a divide in thinking and beliefs, there is a huge emotive outcry. When I started my review, you have to do something called a call for evidence, where you send out letters and, uh, no, sorry, you send out questions, large questions which people can access online and social networking and sites and blah, 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 and ask, what do you think I need to be thinking about and what are your views? And I got thousands and thousands of responses um, from, stake, from a whole variety of stakeholders. So I had policymakers, um, civil servants, those were put in the dustbin. I had, um, I had people who worked in the internet industry, I had law enforcement, I had educationists, I had the third sector, children's charities, I had parents, and I had children. 
um, young people. And without wanting to kind of get down and be cool with the kids, who do you think gave me the most sensible, the most coherent, the most focused, and the most clear argument for empowerment rather than for regulation when it comes to kids and the online world? The kids. You can speak. The kids, absolutely. And I remember talking to a nine-year-old boy, and we did loads of focus groups, and I talked to this boy, and he said, you know what, Tanya, I have to tell you, I, can't, I find the internet quite scary. I thought, well, yeah, you know, kind of online predators, and mm, it's a bit scary. And, mm. and he said, well, actually, I'll tell you why. He said, I really like it, and I like playing games, and I can play online games with my cousins in Australia, which is really cool, and, you know, I can send my granny in Australia stuff that I've done at school, and that's really cool, and all that kind of stuff. He said, but the other day I was kind of clicking away on all these different websites, and I was clicking, and I suddenly this army website came up, and I clicked, and then I thought, crumbs, and then I had to go downstairs for supper, so I quickly closed it all down. And while we were having supper, there was a ring at the doorbell, and I got really panicky because I thought the army were coming to collect me, and that I'd somehow, <laughs> I'd somehow um, you know, put myself up, and I was now a soldier. Now, I thought that was really cute, actually, because I think what he was saying is, this is a great place, I can do lots of fantastic things, but I'm only nine, and it's quite big, and I wish someone would just kind of give me a bit of an understanding about where to go and what to do. And I think this is, this is the key issue when we look at the digital divide. And the biggest thing that we have to deal with is the moral panic that surrounds any conversations about becoming digital, whether it's the losing your local post offices or kids becoming sort of monosyllabic, non-communicating, fat-thumbed um, sort of idiots who can't do anything but just stare at screens all day. I had people suggesting to me that I um, shut the internet at 9 o'clock. I had people suggesting to me that I made the government put a, water, um, put a uh, watershed on the internet at 9 o'clock. So after 9 o'clock, in the UK, you can't find nasty things on the internet. It's global, 9 o'clock in the UK, maybe something else somewhere else. One person helpfully suggested that the way to get around online predators is to just make it a law that um, computer shops and online retailers and offline retailers are not allowed to sell computers to paedophiles. Um, obviously, that was one that I took straight to government and is now policy. But what was really interesting to me is when you think about the whole debate around digital divides, digital exclusion, children, the, the you know, older adults and that kind of stuff, and you talk about giving people more of this stuff, you, you, you don't just get the why the web if they haven't got water. But what you get is this whole panic around the erosion of the morals and the fabric of society. And I think it's really interesting when you talk about the social and moral case, Martha, and you talk about how loneliness goes down 80% and confidence goes up 60%. And when you talk to kids with learning disabilities or kids with Asperger's or autism or even adults with disabilities for whom the online world has transformed their lives, young people with Asperger's who've told me that they now have friends they can't do friendship very well face to face, but they can through the online world. I wonder why we're so intent on being so negative about this space when it comes to children and young people. Certainly the moral panic is fueled by the media. Don't want to be a boring old sort of fart about this, but you know, you know, a, a boy in Norway goes, I think it was Norway, no, was it Norway? No, Finland maybe. Anyway, goes in and he shoots a few of his classmates, a horrible kind of school shooting. The day before he'd posted a bit of a kind of obvious adolescent boy, grumpy, rock and roll, I hate the world thing on um, YouTube. And what did most of the papers call him? The YouTube killer. So technology is not only making our children less clever and less sociable and less communicative, but it's also making them into killers. This is insane, because what we're doing is we're getting so lost in moral panics that always come when something new arrives and challenges our way of living, that we're losing the reality of what this technology can do. Certainly when you look back at the whole idea of moral panic, it's really interesting to read stuff around the time when the printing press was first invented. There was a massive outcry. The church were terrified because suddenly they were not producing printed, uh, well, they weren't producing what was written and read anymore. Uh, printed material was available to everybody and anybody could put their ideas on paper. Goodness me, what is going to happen to society? What we know about the online world, it is a democratizing force. There are bad things online. There are harmful and inappropriate things online for children and young people. But who's going to regulate that? Am I going to tell everybody what I think is harmful and inappropriate? Is Martha Lane Fox? Maybe Rory could tell us. What about Gordon? Maybe he could tell us. 
Harmful and inappropriate is a subjective choice that we have to decide for ourselves, with our children and young people and ourselves, what is appropriate. But also we have to recognise that the more you close down, the more you clamp down on risk, the more you lose opportunity. One of the things I think that's a real problem with this whole conversation around the digital divide is the fact that risk is so clearly thought about in terms of any uh, discussion around um, inclusion, around um, uh, children, more children online, more, more vulnerable people online. And it seems to me that the context in which we're doing this is the risk-averse culture that we live in. Now, it's really interesting to me when you look at divides because, for example, if you just recently, I was talking to a load of primary school children at, with, with all the parents and teachers and governors. It was a large conference. There were many schools there. One woman got up and walked out and said she thought she'd, uh, she was coming to an e-safety conference. She thought it was a drug awareness day. Uh, we told her it wasn't about how to take e safely. It was about um, the internet. But she left and everybody else was happy. But... Um, we did an interesting exercise, and I'll do it with you now, although we have got... Well, you're kind of not very young people, are you? You're kind of older. But um, think about the time in your... Think about the favourite place you had to play when you were a child. If it was outside, put your hand up. OK. If it was away from the direct supervision of adults, put your hand up. Now, the really interesting thing is when I did this with these, with these adults and kids, the primary school children, most of them don't play outside and most of them don't play away from the direct supervision of adults. Why? Because we think they're so at risk in this risk-averse culture that we live in that they're now having to do their childhood indoors. Most kids are raised in captivity. And what's really interesting to me is you can see this being played out everywhere. Kids can't climb trees anymore. Not allowed to climb trees at school. Most schools, you can't play conkers without wearing goggles. There was a recent health and safety directorate going around Barnet that any primary school that had conker trees um, that were growing over the, over the playground might want to send the little ones out with small yellow hard hats on. <laughs> I know, it's insane, but it's true. We know that more and more children are being, um, and young people are being admitted to A&E nowadays because they don't know how to fall. So they're having more minor injuries than were recorded in the last 15 years. And we know from a recent Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents report that six times as many children are crushed um, um, by, uh, 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 fatally, fatally injured by um, large electronic pieces of equipment in the home than they are in, in outdoor playgrounds. So we have this perverse, risk-averse culture we're driving children to do their childhood indoors, and so they're doing it online. But the interesting thing to me, if we want to talk about digital divides, is when you actually have a conversation with children about being online, you ask these questions. When you went outdoors for the first time, did your mum and dad teach you how to cross the road? Yeah. How did they do that? Well, they took my hand, they crossed the road, and then I could walk next to them, and then I walked to them, and so on and so on. Great. When you went online for the first time, did your mum and dad talk to you about stuff, about white lists, about privacy settings, about anything? No. So who talked to you about it? My mates. Uh, one eight-year-old said to me, oh, I get kind of like loads of stuff from my friends on Facebook. I've got 700 friends. I don't really know any of them, but like they can tell me how to do stuff and how to kind of do cheat. Eight years old. And so here we have a situation where we have this perverse, ir ironic state where we have such a paranoid fear of risk when it comes to children in the offline world. We're raising them in captivity, but they're doing their childhood in the online world where we're not preparing them for risk at all. It seems to me that that is a massive divide. And when you start to talk about education, the divide deepens. When I did my first round of conferences, when my review was published, I was at the National Union of Head Teacher something or other conference. And uh, everybody was very good, thank you, excellent, excellent. And one had said to me, um, could I have a copy of your review, please? And I said, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Here's, here's the web address. He said, oh, no, I, I don't do that. C could you post it to me? OK. I think that we should have video game labs in schools. The reason I think that is because children learn through video gaming. I'm not talking Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty 2. I'm talking games... OK, well, maybe you do play Call of Duty 2 at your school. <laughs> but I'm talking, I mean, I'm talking about games. For example, you get a group of young kids. I'm talking about young kids here. You get a group of kids and you say, OK, we're going to do some urban planning today, kids. You then say, OK, here's our interactive whiteboard. Here's our nice little pieces of paper. Let's do a little bit of thinking. You go and build a bit of a town here. Let's, small groups, let's discuss it. 
You then take them and you say, okay, here's SimCity. You can build that community. You build that community. You build that community. Come back and tell me what you did. I know what the kids would, where you'd get the most motivated lesson, and I think I know where you'd get the most learning. But you talk about putting technology into schools, the, the level of moral panic goes up to such a degree that it's quite startling, and I have to say, I think it's discriminatory practice. Just because the older generation doesn't understand it doesn't mean to say that it isn't important, possible, and necessary. And if we want to have a strong digital economy and competent and responsible digital citizens, we need to start in classrooms very young. Because I shared a platform with a very outspoken lady, Sue Palmer, recently, who wrote a book called Toxic Childhood, which basically said that it's all horrible being a kid nowadays and we should just give up and go home. And um, she felt very strongly that, um, that computers should not be in classrooms until children were at least eight years old. By eight years old, most of them are building websites. I mean, I think we have to get away from, it wasn't like this in my day, and we have to get into a place where we narrow this divide, we talk to children and young people, and we look at the exciting and incredible things that are going on online for them. I think that technology shouldn't just be ICT in schools, it should be part of the pedagogy. I think the way we teach kids and young people should harness the motivation and the enthusiasm for what it is they love to do. And interestingly, there are people here taking notes about my talk, and there are young people in the back here with their Mac notebooks writing and twittering and whatever, saying, God, she's boring, it's a load of crap, or whatever you want to say. But um, already you can see the digital divide. Can I just ask you, how many, um, how many people under the age of 25 are wearing a watch in this room? Okay, how many people over the age of 25 are wearing a watch in this room? I mean, there's another example of the digital divide. If you say, I've said to my son the other day, why aren't you wearing a watch? Why would I wear a watch, Mum? To tell the time, he got out his mobile phone. He, he went, 83 functions, one. <laughs> I said, well, actually, two. It tells me the date as well. Um, let me bring this to a, to a close. We have people who are excluded, and we need to address that seriously. We also have people who are included, but are not being given the opportunity to grow and learn as digital citizens, because most of us who are in positions of education or policy making just don't get it, and, and retreat into underconfident, tired, and paranoid ways of thinking about uh, the digital issues when it comes to children and young people. I think. It's discriminatory practice. I think it's discriminatory practice that Martha has 10 million people, but she can only give it, get 4 million of them online. 10 million of them should be online. It's web, it's water, it's life. It's just what we are now and what we have to be. And I think it's discriminatory practice that children with learning difficulties who can learn using the online space have to sit in classrooms and learn in traditional ways that other children find easier than them. This is the world we live in. I think we just have to, in the words of the king, who lived in Graceland, have a little less conversation and a little more action and just get ourselves moving towards being the great digital economy that we all must be. Thank you.